are we to cast judgment on others when each of us carries our own imperfections? Andrew Beckett, also known as Andy, holds a senior position at Philadelphia's premier corporate law firm. Andy keeps his homosexuality and AIDS diagnosis concealed at work. Andy arrives at work to a warm greeting from his colleagues, signaling his popularity in the office. Realizing it's late, he sends his assistant home. Settling into his office, Andy calls his mom to reassure her about his recent blood work, mentioning that Dr. Gilman said the results were excellent. He is an exceptional lawyer, highly skilled and proficient in his work. At 10 p.m., Bob notifies Andy of a meeting with Charles. Despite the late hour, Andy eagerly attends. They discuss the Highline versus Sander systems, and the owners of the firm are pleased with Andy's input. Andy is assigned a high-profile case by the senior partners at Wyatt Wheeler with a 10-day deadline. Walter Kenton congratulates him, noticing a mark on his forehead from a racquetball game. Charles Wheeler expresses strong belief in Andy's potential. Nine days later, Andy is working late into the night. He places the Highline complaint on his desk for Jamie Collins and informs Shelby, his assistant. Andy takes the afternoon to work from home, and Miranda Bailey assists him in covering up his lesions with foundation a few shades off. Suddenly, Andy feels a sharp pain in his abdominal area and rushes to the washroom. Miguel Alvarez, Andy's partner, accompanies Andy at the hospital, visibly stressed. Andy gets a beep and notices Joe on TV by the phone booth. Shelby informs Andy that the Highline complaint is missing, causing Jamie to panic. Andy remembers leaving it on his desk the previous night, but Jamie finds nothing on the hard drive. A week later, Andy, looking sickly, greets Joe. Joe notices Andy's appearance and asks about his face. Andy reveals he has AIDS, causing Joe to pull back his hand immediately. While Andy comments on the baby photo, Joe stares at Andy's lesions and the things Andy touches. Joe cuts to the chase, learning that Andy was fired. Andy was fired and intends to sue for wrongful termination. Andy recounts how he misplaced a crucial complaint leading to his dismissal. Despite his efforts to retrieve it, the original document vanished overnight, only to reappear just before court. This turn of events raises questions about the firm's confidence in Andy, especially since they assigned him the high-profile case. Joe dismisses the case, admitting it's a personal decision. Andy steps out of Joe's office, his eyes filled with despair. Joe visits his family doctor. The doctor explains how AIDS is contracted to Joe and tries to take a blood sample to reassure him, regardless of his private life. Joe laughs it off. Lisa, Joe's wife, brings up a list of people they know who are gay. Joe is honest about his dislike for homosexuals, while Lisa is accepting of them. During the holiday season, Joe sneaks into the library to enjoy his sandwich secretly. He notices a librarian giving him a strange look as he passes by. Meanwhile, an older librarian approaches Andy, offering HIV-related discrimination materials. This grabs the attention of those around, including Joe, who starts stacking books to discreetly observe. The librarian insists that Andy use the private research room for comfort, prompting Joe to lower his head behind the book stack, eager to watch the interaction unfold. Despite the librarian's persistence, Andy firmly declines. Joe then stands up to greet Andy, surprising him. Joe discovers that Andy intends to represent himself. He inquires about the case. Andy explains Walter Kenton worked at a different firm with a paralegal who openly displayed AIDS-related lesions at work but wasn't fired. Andy intends to bring this case to the Supreme Court. Andy's findings suggest that the 1973 Federal Vocational Rehabilitation Act prevents AIDS discrimination by recognizing it as both a physical handicap and a target of social prejudice, affirming that individuals with AIDS are fully capable of performing their job duties. Six weeks later, the firm's partners receive a court summons from Joe, the TV guy. 
Charles Wheeler is determined to gather information about Andy, while Bob suggests settling the matter out of court. Wheeler is particularly agitated, alleging that Andy brought aides into the men's club and the office. Bob is reminded that Andy was fired for incompetence, not because of his aide's diagnosis. Andy takes Miguel to his parents' 40th anniversary celebration at the home where he grew up. He shares with his family the potential publicity surrounding his case and how it might impact them. His family wholeheartedly supports his decision to stand up for his rights and expresses immense pride in him. In court, Joe addresses the jury, emphasizing Andy's legal right to keep his AIDS diagnosis private. Andy's firing was not due to incompetence, but rather discrimination. The defendant argued that Andy's performance was unstable, portraying him as a victim who lied to conceal his illness. They claimed the partners at Wyatt Wheeler were unaware of his condition and suggested Andy was simply angry due to his promiscuous behavior. A witness downgraded their assessment of his work from excellence to satisfactory. Outside of the courtroom, the area is crowded with people. Reporters swarm Andy, questioning if he views the case as a gay rights issue. Andy openly acknowledges his sexual orientation, but emphasizes that his fight for justice is not about sexuality. It's about fairness and what is right. Melissa, a former colleague of Walter Kenton, contracted AIDS through a blood transfusion during childbirth. Despite the uncontrollable circumstances of her contraction, she asserts that she's no different from others and is simply trying to survive. The defense counsel questions discrimination allegations by pointing out the promotion of an African-American female colleague. The witness suggests that the defense has oversimplified the matter. Joe is offended by the advances made by the law student at the store. Shelby, Andy's assistant, tearfully explains in court how the missing complaint was found and praises Andy as a good boss. Joe argues that the case is about the broader issue of hatred towards homosexuality, not just AIDS. This fear and bias led to Andy's termination. Walter Kenton sympathizes with Melissa, acknowledging her contraction of the disease without fault, while contrasting it with Andy's situation, where his deception and promiscuity led to his illness. Andy hosts a party with Miguel and congratulates Joe for attending his first full gay party. Andy and Joe prepare for trial while listening to opera. Andy is deeply moved by the piece La Mama Morta, contrasting with Joe's demeanor. As Andy passionately explains the lyrics, Joe undergoes a profound change of heart, recognizing Andy's love for life and reluctance to leave it. Later, at Joe's home, he lies awake in bed, wrestling with his emotions in the darkness. Back in court, the defendant's lawyer presents a mirror to Andy, arguing that the lesions aren't visible, questioning how the firm's partners could have been aware of them. However, Joe intervenes, asking Andy to undress, revealing the lesions to everyone, proving that they were indeed noticeable and the partners knew about them. Andy then shares his initial plan to come out as gay, but refrained due to homophobic remarks from his bosses at the men's club. He admits to contracting the disease through anonymous sex at a pornographic theater. A pivotal moment arises when Bob confesses to suspecting Andy's AIDS condition, but he regrets his silence. During Wheeler's testimony, Andy collapses and is rushed to the hospital. The jury discusses Andy's case. In the final verdict, they ruled in Andy's favor, awarding him nearly $4.5 million for punitive damages. After receiving the good news, Joe visits Andy in the hospital, not minding to touch his face and assisting him with the oxygen mask. Later, Andy confides in Miguel that he feels prepared to face death. Shortly afterward, Joe receives the heartbreaking news of Andy's passing. At Andy's reception at home, home movies of Andy as a healthy child plays on the TV. A plane loses control and crashes into a building in New York City. Captain Sully wakes up from the nightmare, gasping for air. To clear his mind, he goes for a run and narrowly avoids being hit by a car. A week ago, 
Captain Solly safely landed U.S. Airways Flight 1549 on the river, saving 155 lives. Now known as the miracle on the Hudson, media coverage still reflects on this remarkable event, while survivors expresses gratitude for the captain's heroic actions. Solly and his co-pilot Jeff Skillis, also a friend, are called into the National Transportation Safety Board meeting. Charles Porter questions why Solly didn't return to LaGuardia. Solly explains that the altitude was inefficient and it would have been risky. Relying on his experience, he made quick decisions. Despite theoretical calculations on losing both engines, he trusted his judgment. Solly requests to oversee the simulation, and it was denied. Solly maintains contact with his wife Lorraine and their daughters, but Lorraine is concerned about his well-being since the incident. The media scrutinize the event, and Solly faces questioning by reporters. During an interview, he dismisses the label of national hero. He's a man simply doing his job. Solly has been flying for forty-two years. A flashback takes us to his teen years, flying with Lieutenant Cook, a crop dusting pilot, who taught him important lessons of making mistakes and learning from them, and to never forget, no matter what happens, to fly the airplane. During the interview break, Solly stands by the window and hallucinates, seeing Fly One Five Four Nine crash into the building. Mike informs Solly, "A car's data." Indicated the left engine was still idle, and NTSB knows. But Solly personally felt both engines fail while in midair. At another meeting, Jeff stands in defense of Solly. He meticulously lays out the series of actions Solly took during the incident, underscoring Solly's reliance on his wealth of experience rather than rigidly adhering to the safety protocol list, which Jeff. Had in his hands, Elizabeth presents evidence from a car's data, indicating that the left engine was idle. The computer simulations have replicated successful landings at both Laguardia and Teterboro runways with the same parameters. Solly finds himself at a loss for words, requesting to review the parameters of the situation. Elizabeth mentions that the footage of the simulation. Will be kept confidential until the investigation is concluded, citing concerns about media interference. Solly expresses to Jeff that the current recounting of the events from the meeting doesn't match his memory of the incident. Jeff acknowledges. Solly, Jeff, and the three flight attendants join David Leatherman's show to recount their experience. In a flashback to that fateful day, Solly takes off from Laguardia. And soars over the cityscape. Solly announces birds as the aircraft engine collide with the flock of birds. Passengers feel the jolt. Solly calmly declares, "Both engines are down." He initiates the APU and instructs Jeff to retrieve the quick reference handbook. Solly contacts air traffic control, informing them of the loss of thrust on both engines and the need to return to Laguardia. As air traffic noted the emergency, Laguardia cleared a runway. Solly, resolute, reports the possibility of a Hudson landing. Air traffic swiftly arranges water rescue. Solly requires about the plane's right side and runway availability at Teterboro in New Jersey. Immediately, a runway is cleared in Teterboro. Radar contact is lost. A helicopter spots the A320, confirming the impending water landing. Air traffic recalls doubting Solly's Hudson choice. His calm voice belying the gravity of the situation. While jogging, Solly is besieged by doubts and about his water landing. A passing jet triggers a flashback to his youth, when he faced a hydraulic malfunction while flying a jet. Though instructed to turn towards a nearby runway, Solly remains resolute in his decision to maintain a straight course ahead. Also urged to slow down, Solly remains steadfast in his need for speed to maintain control. Drawing on his experience, he executed a successful landing, ensuring the safety of him and the passenger. Solly takes a seat at a bar, 
prompting recognized by both bartenders and the fellow patrons as the television airs news about him. On January 15th, 2009, a man crossing bridges, an elderly gentleman in his apartment, and a businessman in a meeting all witnessed a low-flying plane heading towards the city. The passengers, praying and anxious, follow the flight attendant's instruction to stay down as the plane descends. As the aircraft plunges into the river, time seems to pause momentarily, leaving passengers uncertain of what lays ahead as water floods in. Solly quickly takes charge, directing everyone to evacuate and grab life jackets, while flight attendants announce the opening of the forward door. With water beginning to flood in, more exit doors are open, and passengers must evacuate urgently. Amidst the chaos, a man jumps into the water, attempting to swim to the city. While others continue their evacuation efforts, Solly distributes blankets to combat the chilling cold, emphasizing the need for swift rescue to prevent hypothermia. As one woman slips into the water, the New York Coast Guard swiftly responds to the unusual sight of a plane in the water, racing to the scene for immediate rescue. The flight crew instructs everyone to keep moving forward and to keep their life jackets on. Some passengers slide down the raft while others stand on the wing of the plane. The rescue boat from the Coast Guard arrives, providing passengers with additional life jackets, blankets, and assistance onto the boat. More rescue boats arrive to land aid. Passengers, some crying, may feel a sense of relief at having survived the ordeal. With the water temperature at 35 Fahrenheit and a wind chill of minus 5, reports indicate the passengers have only minutes to survive. A helicopter joins the rescue effort with a team diving into the water to assist passengers who have fallen into the river. Solly ensures that everyone is off the plane, swiftly gathers his belonging, and is the last to exit the aircraft. Together with Jeff, he unhooks the raft attached to the plane. 300 men join the rescue efforts. The man who attempted to swim to the city is rescued. Solly, the last to board the rescue boat, ascends and gazes back at the plane in the water. He calls his wife to reassure her and their daughters of his safety. Upon returning to New York, Solly urgently requests a headcount from his colleague, Dan eagerly for reassurance and promises to provide the count promptly. Meanwhile, a son reaches out to his father, relieved to have been rescued to the New Jersey side. In the air traffic control office, the staff grapples with the loss of a plane full of passengers. His colleague informs him of the miraculous landing in the river. Concerned for the welfare of the fly attendants, Solly inquires about their injuries as they undergo medical examinations. Upon receiving the headcount of exactly 155, Solly feels a wave of relief wash over him. Arriving at the hotel, Solly discovers a fortune cookie note in his wallet that reads, A delay is better than a disaster. From the flashback, Solly remembers something. He called Larry to request for the simulation at the hearing in two days. At the Federal Aviation Administration, Solly and Jeff arrive for the National Transportation Safety Board meeting. At Solly's request, they upload simulations of the flight. The first simulation reenacts the bird encounter and landing at LaGuardia with the computer warning of low altitude before a successful landing. In the second simulation, heading to Teterboro, another successful landing is achieved. Charles questions the purpose of viewing the simulation. Solly asserts that human factors must be considered, noting that the pilots were experienced and act promptly after the bird strike without checking the auxiliary power unit. Charles interrupts, reminding Solly that the parameters are the same. Solly emphasized that no one could have predicted a dual engine loss at such a low altitude. It's never occurred in aviation history, yet the pilots calmly return to the runway without panic, with 155 lives on board as if it's a routine task. No pilot has ever been trained for such a situation before. Regarding the landing at Teterboro, 
with an unrealistic bank angle. Solly inquired about the pilot's training and preparation. Elizabeth revealed that the pilot had practiced the landing seventeen times before. The board has agreed to conduct the simulation with a thirty-five second delay for human analysis, reactions, and decision making. The scenarios unfold differently in the new simulation. After the burst strike, the crew awaits for thirty-five seconds before heading towards Lagorda. The automated voice warns of terrain and advises pulling up, but the plane ultimately crashes into a bridge. In the Teterboro simulation, shortly after the wait, the pilot acknowledges being too low. The jet alarm goes off again. They crash into the city. Following the simulations, they listen to the cockpit voice recording of January fifteenth, two thousand and nine. As the plane takes off, Solly warns Jeff of the potential. Or strike. Assessing the situation, Solly immediately realizes that both engines are hit. He initiates the accelerate power unit and instructs Jeff to retrieve the quick reference handbook. With thrust lost on both engines, Solly communicates with air traffic and initiates a turn. Although Laguarda's runway is available, Solly informs them. Of their inability to make it and the possibility of landing in the Hudson River, Jeff diligently checks all settings according to the QRH. Solly inquires about Teterboro as the aircraft passes over the river and bridge. The automated warning system alerts them, prompting Solly to instruct passengers to brace for impact as he secures his seatbelt. Air traffic confirms Teterboro as an option, but Solly remains skeptical. Foreseeing a landing in the Hudson River, despite the ongoing warnings, Solly maintains his composure and guides Jeff on what to do. The automated voice persists as they navigate the critical situation. From the cockpit, the front window is almost at eye level as Solly gently controls the aircraft for the forced landing. The plane glides across the river. After the CVR is played, Solly takes a moment to collect himself. Jeff joins him. Solly reflects on the experience, acknowledging the numerous distractions they face, highlighting their teamwork and successful execution of their duties. Returning to the hearing, Charles remarks that this is the first time they've listened to a CVR recording and describes it as extraordinary. Elizabeth reports on the finding of the retrieved crash plane. The previous A car's report was incorrect. Both engines were indeed not working, just as Solly had stated. In every scenario of the investigation, Solly's decision would not have led to a successful outcome, resulting in him as the answer to the equation. But Solly humbly disagrees, attributing the successful outcome to the collective efforts of the entire flight crew, passengers, rescue crew, and air traffic control. Solly emphasizes that the number one fifty five represents more than just a numerical figure. It symbolizes the lives of real people, each with their own identities, relationships, and stories. For upcoming content, click like, pound that subscribe, and hit notification. Thank you for watching.